What's up guys? It is never too early to start talking about the 2024 presidential race. We've got Donald Trump. He's already kind of hinting at the fact that he might be running. He's taking a trip down to the border. He's doing increasing number of speeches and rallies on Candace here in Daily Wire. He was kind of hinting at the fact he might run. Uh, the answer is I'm absolutely enthused. I look forward to doing an announcement at the right time. Uh, as you know, it's very early, but I think people are going to be very, very happy uh, when I make a certain announcement. You've got other potential candidates, governors, senators that are starting to hire staffs. So 2024 is going to be here sooner than we think, which means that we should probably talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally exhausted of not talking about elections. I feel like it dominated our lives for four years and it's about time we started again. It is. So I think any conversation on the 2024 race, you have to address the elephant in the room, which is Donald Trump. We'll talk about that at the end, the hypothetical if he does run. To start, I think it would be good to, to assume he's not going to run and then have that conversation because they're two very different conversations. Yeah, completely different universe of the world where Trump runs and Trump doesn't. I think if Trump doesn't, it's a completely open field. And if Trump does run, I think that's an inherent advantage that I think would change everything. Georgia, I'll start with you. If Trump doesn't run in 24, who are you looking at as the main contender? I think everyone is saying Ron DeSantis. And then once you get sort of a tier down, I think there's probably like three or four, you know, next tier people. But I think Ron DeSantis for sure is the front runner right now. I think he's all of President Trump's strengths and really none of his weaknesses. I think he was a fantastic governor during COVID. Florida really, if the left were correct, should have been just a giant graveyard. And the fact it's not is testament to his abilities as a governor, just COVID alone. For me, the, the thing that jumps out with, with Ron DeSantis is the ability to combat with the media in a way that Trump did, but almost, I think DeSantis, he knows how to play the game very well with the media. He gives it back to them, which I think people love. You're, you're, you're giving a speech, you asked the question. I'm not dismissing, but I'm here's, here's the facts. Right now, excuse me, excuse me. But he's got the policy background. He's a Harvard guy, which a lot of people don't really realize because sometimes they assume that he just kind of popped up out of nowhere. But big educational background, got a background with the military, law background, so I think kind of a well-rounded guy there. Um, but you bring up the point that it's early. My concern is if he's coming out right now, right out of the gate, there's three years to smear him, find dirt on him, and create sort of this mythology of how he's a white supremacist leading up to the election. To be fair though, we've had a year of that already. I think yeah. the fact he's come out unscathed from COVID, again, shows just how strong candidate he is because I mean, we had, what, over a year of being told that Andrew Cuomo is basically the second or third coming of Christ, whoever the latest choice of their leader is. And he is really single-handedly responsible for one of the highest, if not the highest, death rate in certain categories. That's a good point about DeSantis, how he's kind of been in the spotlight to where if there was this big skeleton in the closet, you would think it would have been brought forward. I mean, what's the biggest thing they got him on this year? There was the scandal that he was helping his friends get vaccines first, which turned out to be completely nothing. There was the Florida state official that came out and tried to say that he was fudging the numbers and that he was doing this horrible job. And it turns out she was making the entire story up, even though the media gave her a platform. A heroic whistleblower accusing Governor Ron DeSantis of, demand, of demanding that she falsify data. Turns out the lady NPR called a top scientist was about as much of a scientist as Bill Nye. In fact, she had held three non-scientist jobs. All of them had her fired and criminally charged. I don't know what the big hit would be on him. And in Florida, you see a state where immigration is so important and he's already taking this step of, hey, I'm going to Texas. We're sending people to the border. So I think he's trying to get in on that national conversation about immigration, which is smart. And so it does appear like he's clearly taking steps. And are we all just kind of assuming he's going to run? Do any of us think he won't? Has he announced anything? He hasn't announced yet. I mean, once you get into the process of saying, I'm going to run or I'm launching an exploratory committee, from like an FEC standpoint, it does make things more complicated. But if you look at some of the people he's hiring, for a while it was just he and his wife. That was his advisory team. It was him and his wife, and he said, I don't make, come, make decisions without her. And now he is starting to hire some you know, renowned campaign strategist type folks that give the impression that he's gonna be running in 24. I think my last comment on DeSantis is just the context of COVID is such a strong factor for him. He was so exemplary. I think that's just like such a defining gold medal he can just wear throughout the next couple of years. I think if COVID hadn't happened, I don't think I'd be anywhere near as enthusiastic, but I just think the fact that in the face of the media who are doing their very best to present Cuomo as the hero and DeSantis as the villain, like he fought with the media, but 
like maintaining his dignity, which I think is actually quite hard to do. Well, he's also pretty strong on some of the culture war issues. So I think about he recently signed something in Florida about critical race theory, which is right now the number one issue among voters, I think by it's a plurality at least, of people who think that's their number one issue of you know all voters, not just uh, Republican voters. So, I mean, and I believe, does he have any legislation in Florida about um, like trans girls and sports? Yeah, on June 1st, they banned uh, trans athletes from competing. So Yeah, he, so he's like yeah. coming out pretty strong on some of the cultural issues that I think are driving people that will continue to drive them beyond COVID. So I think we all agree DeSantis, I personally think, is the front runner in 24, assuming Trump doesn't run. Do we agree on that? Yeah, I think he's the front runner, even if Trump. I think he's the front runner. But we'll save Trump. that for later. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll save that conversation for a little bit later. <laughs> yeah. So I think you have DeSantis in the clear. If you look at the polling data too, is one of the clear front runners. I also l like to throw Rand Paul's name into the mix. Yeah. I think while we're on the topic of COVID, he's been one of the most outspoken voices on the subject of the science. So r while uh, DeSantis has been really in the conversation when it comes to vaccines or policy, I think Rand Paul has been so hard on the science Democrats and really hitting them hard for pure lies in a lot as of a cases, too. as a doctor, as someone who caught COVID early on. So do you still Bobby? support sending money to the Wuhan Virology Institute? We do not send money now to the Wuhan do Virology Institute. Do you support Institute? sending money? We did, under your tutelage, we were sending it through EcoHealth. It was a sub-agency right. and a sub-grant. And so I think he could benefit from the, the sort of science element of the COVID debate. Um, I don't think to the same extent as DeSantis, but I think he's a pretty strong name because of his behavior in the but last couple of months. keep in mind, this is going to be 2024. A lot of people are going to be like, why are we still talking about COVID? You need someone who has, you know, well-rounded like portfolio of things that they're fighting for. And I think of, you know, Rand Paul as being pretty strong on the COVID stuff, but he doesn't have the same, um, and I mean, part of that is maybe he's just hasn't been in the news about it, but he doesn't have the same well-roundedness that DeSantis does right now. That's for sure. I think one thing that could hurt Rand Paul if he did run in 24 is the fact that people would say, what's different from 2016? Obviously, he has the COVID credentials, and he was certainly influential on President Trump's foreign policy from 2016 to 2020, really kind of bringing in this more dovish approach, which Trump supporters loved. He's just not a great campaigner. Speaking of South Dakota, yeah, Christy Nome. She's you up my there. pick, yeah. <laughs> what do you think of Christy Nome? I think she's a really strong candidate. I'm not sure if she has what it takes to pull ahead and be, you know, the top of the ticket, but I think she would be a great uh, VP for, I would say, several of the people that we'll probably discuss today. Having Christy Noem on the debate stage is a good thing for the Republican Party. Yeah. I think she's whether poised. You, yeah. Whether you like it or not, we live in an era of identity politics from the media and from the left, and they are going to constantly bring up if there if there aren't a you know if there aren't women on stage, if there aren't non-white men on stage, that's all you're going to hear about, and that shouldn't matter. But from an optic standpoint, it, it is good for the Republican Party to say, hey, we've got this diverse roster of people that goes up there that can appeal to different people. While we're on this topic. Um, I think we're ignoring the issue of race, which I think the Democrats will immediately fall back on the moment COVID has had its last drop of blood squeezed out of it. And I think Tim Scott has been one of the most vocal Republicans on the issue of race. And so I think he's one of the names that's at least in the mix, simply because he's one of the most authoritative and just loudest voices on these issues. And he's remained focused on it despite COVID, which I think is going to be really important. I think his State of the Union rebuttal really <clears throat> surprised a lot of people and introduced him on a national stage in the way that he hadn't been in the past. And also, I think he's he's one of these guys who's, he's very positive. I don't see him actually faring well in a primary system, because you brought up, in order to win a primary, you've got to be able to rile up the most people in the Republican base. That's typically what happens. And Tim Scott isn't one of these guys that's as much of a flamethrower that's willing to throw as much of the red meat to some of the primary voters that you kind of need. There's a few people from Florida that we think might run, Ron DeSantis. Senator Marco Rubio is another person. You've got Rick Scott in there. Do you see either of them going forward? I don't see Rubio going just simply because of the Chris Christie moment. That's what Washington DC does. The drive-by shot at the beginning with incorrect and incomplete information, and then the memorized 25 second speech that is exactly what his advisors gave him. I think everyone has this viral moment that you can just unpackage at any time. And I think that was so damning. Um, I'm great hit by Christie. Um, but I just, I don't see how you rec recover from that. And I don't think he's been particularly relevant, I think is probably the right word in the last couple of years. I don't think he's been one of these forefront characters. So I think to, he hasn't done anything to really recover from that image blow, I think that he would need to do. So I think the other big elephant in the room here for 24 
is Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, vice presidents, they end up running at some point down the road. But we don't know if Trump would endorse Mike Pence. They obviously had a falling out in 2020. I think Pence is also in a tough spot here because you're looking for a base. Anytime you're launching a presidential race, it's who is my clear, definable base. And I don't know who that is for Mike Pence because I think if Trump runs, obviously the Trump MAGA base is, is not going to go to Pence over Trump. If you've got a Ron DeSantis type, I think he's someone that's going to capitalize on the MAGA base. And so Pence might find himself looking for a different base, which is ironic because he was completely loyal to the MAGA movement for four years. And then there was, you know, the falling out at the end there. But it was a guy who, if anyone should be able to capitalize on that base, I don't necessarily see that happening. So I think we're at that stage, the stage we promised at the very, the Trump very stage. Uh, on onset whether or not Trump runs and whether or not he should run. I don't know. I have my doubts about whether he's going to run. I think that he's looking at some of the front runners and thinking who's who am I going to like pass the torch to? I don't I think he would have said it already if he was going to run. But if he said he's going to run right now, it presents all sorts of problems for him down the road. He's not able to fundraise the same way if he's a declared candidate, and so that could be a reason for him not. I think he's doing everything but saying he's going to with all the hinting he's saying. And I understand the point though, where he's, he this could is just a, this be This is like a loose-lipped guy. I don't know. He, <laughs> like, he could that's be, a lot of discipline for Trump. If nothing else, if he's not running, he very clearly is dangling the power that he has by saying, whoever I endorse is going yeah, to be- I, I think he's seen himself as like a kingmaker. That's sort of yeah. the role that I, I envision him sort of attempting to step into. When you've lost, you need to come back to the table with something different. It's almost like in Rocky II, Rocky III, when he has a comeback, he vastly changes his strategy. That's why he wins. I knew I could get Rocky in here somehow. <laughs> but he comes back with a completely different strategy, and that's why he wins. But I think Trump he... will come back and just do the same thing again, and it'll be a dream for the Democrats, because they won't have to complain. It's like, hey, you didn't like this guy last time. All just... the things we said remain true. Yeah, I disagree. I think that Trump being the same would be enough to beat Biden, if Biden is even mm -hmm. still running in 24. I mean, if you look at speeches of him, it's not, it's not a sure thing that he's gonna be able to run again. And even the first year here, we're seeing record inflation rates kicking off. We're seeing prices at the pump go up for people. We're seeing uncertainty on the global stage like we haven't seen. We're seeing less peace in the Middle East. We're seeing a lot of the great things that Trump did do starting to unravel a bit. And so I do think there are enough people that would say, wait a second, I didn't like Trump. I didn't vote for him in 2020, but things were better under him. And it'll be a very easy litmus test of four years under Trump, four years under Biden. And I think if Trump comes back the same, they'll say, I'm okay because if he is the same Trump in 2024, they'll say, I know what I'm getting because I had this for four years and I remember this and it was, things were going pretty well before COVID. What I would say is the main concern is if you have a guy who, you know, elicits strong emotion from people the way Trump does, any kind of strong emotion, especially if it's like strong hatred, that sort of dulls people's rational capacities. And so I would just say, you know, if we're hoping that people are gonna make rational decisions about their taxes and about the prices of gas, Trump ain't your guy to put up there. What's our, our 30 second synopsis that we would say of what we expect to happen and what we think should happen? I wanna go first because I think he's gonna say the same thing as okay. me. <laughs> so I actually don't think he's going to run. I think he's going to dangle that for a little while and then I think he's gonna come out strong for DeSantis. I would agree, I think that's what I want to happen. Part of me, the very negative, cynical part of my brain thinks he's gonna run again simply because he hates losing, which is great. Yeah. I think you need people like that in business, but I think that stunned him, losing that, I think stunned him more than possibly anything in his life could. Yeah. And so I think he might run simply because he can't accept that loss. Yeah. I think he sits on the fence for the next few years. I think he will periodically jump into the conversation, sort of as a litmus test to see who defends him and who doesn't. And I think he's gonna try and force all the presumptive candidates to come in and step in and voc vocally support him so that he can say, well, you loved me before you were my opponent. I think at the last minute, he's gonna wait until the very end so that the candidates won't view him as a threat, won't go after him, because going after Trump in a Republican primary, I think is a death wish. And then he's gonna launch right before Iowa. He doesn't need much of a campaign apparatus because he has the name recognition already. He's shown you can win without it. And I do think he would win the nomination if he, uh, if he jumped in. That's what I see happening. I think we also have to talk about some of the underdog candidates because Trump was an underdog candidate. And in 2015, he wasn't even being polled because no one thought it was a serious candidate. So some of those underdog candidates, do we think any of them have a chance? We've got you know the Tom Cottons, Mike Pompeo's of the world. John Kasich is always a perennial guy that might jump in there. Do we think that there's just too much oxygen that's been sucked up in this day and age of 
if there was someone who was going to do it, people would already know about them? Or do you think there's still room for an underdog candidate like that? We've seen this weird pattern with primaries in the last couple of years where you just have millions of people on the stage all fighting for their 20 seconds of viral glory. But I don't think that's really good for the party and I don't think it's even good for the candidates because then everyone's almost immediately forgettable. And I think a lot of these people will find that. I think they might they might run, they might get one or two percent in the polls and make it to the stage. But I think it'll be exactly the same problem in 2016. There's no defining reason that they should be there over someone like Trump, over someone like Ted Cruz, over someone like Ron DeSantis. I think the big names are so obvious even this early on. I think someone would have to do something pretty special to deserve to be among those names. I think if an underdog were going to win, it would have to be like a dark horse who comes out of nowhere who we aren't even talking about right now. So if we're talking about them, they're already sort of... Uh, in the consciousness. Yeah, they're like we already know too much to know that they're not in the top. So, I mean, Trump came out when? In 2014 or 2015, when he ran the first time? And he kind of shot to the front pretty fast. And someone else could do that now that he's especially sort of paved the way for a non-politician to come in kind of late in the game. I think it has to be a celebrity. I think that's what Donald Trump proved. You see this, Democrats, a lot of these big names being thrown around, like, they're always talking about Oprah running, they're always talking about Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson. Rock Johnson running. I think if there was a big name conservative celebrity to come out and run, I think that's the only way in our culture right now that you do well. And that's the kind of point that Trump made was the, the takeaway from Trump, if, of many takeaways, but one of the main takeaways should be people do not trust politicians. They do not trust the establishment. They do not trust the elites telling us what's best for us. And so I agree they would need to be one of those type of people long, if it was yeah. a long shot. The longer you've been in, the dirtier your hands are. Yeah. So, you know, someone coming out of like a, a media job, I think could be successful for that reason. Well, I think we have exhausted all of our hot takes on the 2024 <laughs> race for now. At least for today. At least for today. I'm sure a month from now, some new person will become the front runner and we'll have to come talk about them. But for now, we'll leave it there, guys. Thanks for the conversation. And thank you for tuning in. I'm Cabot Phillips. I'm Ian Howarth. And I'm Georgia Howe. Thanks for watching The Daily Wire. Subscribe to our YouTube channel right now. Let us know in the comments who you think we missed, what we got wrong. Try and keep it as nice as possible. Ian here is very fragile. Very sensitive. We will leave it there. Thanks for watching.